My name is Lisa. My name is Robin. And my name is Adiba. And this is the Asian American Brainstorm. Hello, everybody. Today we're discussing Korean American Susan Ahn Cuddy, who lived from 1915 to 2015. During her life, she became the first Asian American woman in the Navy when she enlisted during World War II. She had a pretty groundbreaking life, and we want to share her story with you all today. Let's do it. All right. So Susan was born on January 16th, 1915 in L.A. She actually had a very cool family, and I think it's important that we discuss that a bit before we get into her life. Her parents, Dosan An, Chong Ho, and Helen, had immigrated in 1902 to the U.S. to pursue a better education. They were actually the first Korean married couple to officially immigrate to the U.S. Just for context, when they immigrated, Korea was actually still united and under the last stages of the Chosun dynasty. Her father was actually born in the Pyongan province, which is now in North Korea. So I actually looked into Korean immigration to U.S., and it seems like her parents were on the very forefront of Korean immigration, which makes their successes in America all the more impressive. So there are basically three major waves of Korean immigration. The first was from 1903 to 1949, which her parents basically led the way on, coming here in 1902. And this wave included political refugees and intellectuals who were trying to escape the Japanese occupation of Korea, as well as a lot of agricultural workers who were encouraged by Christian missionaries to move to Hawaii, California, other West Coast states in order to fill the gap left by the Chinese Exclusion Act. The other two waves were later on following the Korean slash Cold War, as well as after the Immigration Act of 1965, which really opened up the U.S. borders. A lot of my relatives, since I'm part Korean, a lot of them live in California, and there's a large Korean community there. So it, it is interesting to me it, that it was the genesis of this, the Susan on her family moving to California was the genesis of that. So that's pretty cool. Her father was a major leader in the Japanese resistance movement back in Korea. While Susan and her siblings stayed in the U.S., Ahn actually traveled back and forth from Korea to the U.S. to help organize and fight against the Japanese occupation, which was committing many different atrocities at the time. Unfortunately, because of his work, he was captured and put into prison many times by the Japanese. While he survived many arrests... In 1938, after his fifth imprisonment, he ended up dying from injuries he sustained. At the time, Susan was 23 years old. Still, while in the U.S., he immediately began working to create a Korean community at a time where it was basically non-existent. His genesis story is that while he was living in San Francisco, he witnessed two Korean ginseng merchants fighting in the streets over sales. And this was the spark that led him to rise up and become a community leader because he wanted to unite the Korean people. In America. Her father's motto was do your best to be a good American citizen, but never forget your Korean heritage. And he ended up founding the first Korean American political organization, as well as the first Korean newspaper. Uh, he even turned his own home into a safe haven for Korean immigrants. Uh, you would see many young immigrants during this time that would come to the on residence to receive advice on immigrant life. That's so important. I remember when my family first moved to Florida, there was, they were really lucky to have a very strong Chinese American community there to turn to for advice as well as like help. And just having that support network was an integral part of their American experience. And so the fact that her parents helped to create that support network for Korean immigrants is really inspiring. A very similar situation for me when my parents came to Chicago, they, through their like college alumni of other Indian Americans who came to the U.S., they were able to find like these close friends that really kind of became family you could relate to and were there during all those like major life events where you'd want your family around, but you couldn't have. Yeah, it was definitely an incredibly great way for Susan to grow up in this tight-knit community. Another interesting note was that both of her brothers actually were at some point actors. Philip Ahn was the first Korean American to get a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Uh, during his lifetime, he played roles in movies alongside Bing Crosby and Shirley Temple. So that's the level that he was at. As an actor during this time, unfortunately, if you were an Asian, 
you ended up getting a lot of roles that were basically Japanese villains because it was during the World War II era. And so during his uh, lifetime, Philip ended up receiving many death threats from different people who, one, assumed that he was Japanese, and of course, two, assumed all Japanese people were evil. That's really classic that people would just not care uh, about these different ethnicities, despite like the incredibly complex political tensions that were occurring back in Asia. Yeah, I can't count the number of times that people have been like, are you Japanese? Are you Korean? I'm not surprised at all. They really can't tell any of us apart. Yeah, I know for myself at one point, when I was in about middle school, there was a class that I was taking, and there was this person in my class who basically just, I don't think he had any real bad intention. He just regurgitated something that I guess he may have heard in history class, but he basically used a slur, um, like a World War II era slur for Japanese people. And the teacher was like, don't say that. Lisa might be Japanese. (laughs) And I was like, oh, this is so bad on so many levels. So yeah. (laughs) Wow. Oh, yikes. It's still kind of going on today. (laughs) Luckily, it's, it's come a long way, but we're not quite where we really want to be. For sure. The other interesting thing about Susan's childhood and growing up was that she grew up during the height of segregation. From her kid's account of her stories, she actually grew up with a lot of white friends. I believe at this time she did attend white schools. And by them, she was definitely viewed as closer to white than a black person. However, it seems that she was aware of her position as a minority and has even mentioned that as a, one of the first Koreans in America, she was treated as either one of a kind or maybe a bit of a sh- abnormality, depending on whether you view it in a negative or a positive light. I got this from an interview where her kids were talking to an historian and they were recounting some stories that she used to tell them. And one of them was that she got on a bus in Georgia at one point when she was a kid. And, you know, she was going with some white friends. And when they got on, she actually went straight to the back. And her friend said, no, you should sit up front with us. And she said, no, I should sit in the back and then ended up sitting in the back. So it's she was definitely aware. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting anecdote that highlights how complex the Asian American position is within American race relations, like obviously Asian Americans did and still do face a lot of discrimination on account of their race, but they are also given a lot of privileges because they were used as a wedge minority in order to further oppress Black Americans. And so in this particular case, Susan's white friends were trying to give her the privilege to sit in the bus with them and therefore like normalize the oppression and segregation of Black Americans. So I appreciate that Susan refused to take part in this normalization and like sat in the back as a show of solidarity, I assume. We do have to acknowledge that she did receive some privileges throughout her life, whether that was on the bus or in her future education and like throughout her career as well. Completely agree. So growing up, Susan was into sports and played baseball, field hockey, and softball. Before her military career, she went to San Diego State University and graduated with a degree in sociology. But everything changed when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941. So shortly after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, Susan and her two brothers, Ralph and Philip, enlisted in the U.S. Navy. A big motivating factor for her enlistment was that it could be a way for her to help also free Korea from Japanese colonization, which actually, at this point in time, had resulted in the death of her father just three years ago. At first, when she applied, she was actually rejected due to her race. But she tried again for a different sector and got in. She was the first Asian American woman in the Navy. That must have been really tough for her. Of course, she was rejected at first due to her race, because I believe that when the war had first began, Korean Americans were still viewed as enemy aliens due to the Japanese occupation of Korea. And so a lot of Korean Americans were rejected from military and like higher security roles in the government. And actually, it's also really interesting to note that like when Asian Americans were allowed into 
military or like naval roles, they were often relegated to lower statuses because they were people felt like they were perpetual foreigners and thus couldn't be trusted with American intel or just plain racism and that like they didn't want to associate with Asian Americans. So I'm not surprised that she faced those hurdles and had to go through a lot in order to become the first Asian American, but glad that she was able to blaze a trail. Absolutely. In the Navy, she actually ended up being very good at shooting weapons and knew how to work the most complicated ones pretty quickly. And so she ended up becoming the main trainer for these weapons. She would actually teach the new military recruits uh, how to shoot down enemy aircraft. And there were multiple incidents actually during this job of hers where the men that she was teaching would question her authority, given just the complicated both the fact that she was female and a minority at the time. She, however, always knew how to take charge. In fact, there was one incident where a trainee interrupted her explanation of how to shoot and basically used a quote that had a slur for Japanese people. He said, I'm not shooting until I see the whites of their eyes. And Cuddy essentially ignored the slur and she responded, I don't care what you do up there, but while you're down here with me, you do what I tell you to do. That's a tough position to be in, (laughs) to want to foster aggression because you're in the military, but also you don't want that aggression to be fueled by, like, racism. I don't know. I guess that was probably what she thought was the best way to handle it. I agree. It's a tough position, but I'm glad she showed, like, we love a woman who tells, like, who straight up and tells, like, what exactly they're there for. Right. So after the war, she continued to work with the U.S. military, specifically working for U.S. Naval Intelligence, the NSA, and the Library of Congress. She worked up to the rank of lieutenant and worked on many top-secret projects and continued to serve in the U.S. government until 1959. After that, she moved back to L.A. to be with her family and spend more time with her kids. So while she was actually in the Navy, Susan met Frank Cuddy, a U.S. Navy officer, They eventually fell in love and married at the only place that they were allowed to at the time, which was a U.S. Naval Chapel in D.C. The year was 1947, which is actually 20 years before interracial marriage was legalized in the U.S. Frank worked as a Japanese codebreaker and even helped the U.S. free Korea from Japanese occupation. I actually uncovered that Frank liked boxing, and there's a cute picture of Susan and Frank jokingly, like, sparring with each other and, like, It was just very, very sweet. That's super cute. As a mom, she was famous for her Korean spare ribs, which were basically traditional, like, American-style spare ribs, but with Korean seasoning on them. So that was kind of cool. And she could also speak a bunch of different languages. She was, of course, she knew English as well as fluent Korean and bits of Chinese, Russian, and Vietnamese thanks to her military career. Even though she was fluent in Korean, she wouldn't tend to say so. I think that in the interview that I had watched with her son and daughter talking about her life, they mentioned that she would always defer to people who came from Korea and had a bit of a, I guess you could say lack of confidence or better terms, about her language knowledge because of the fact that she was American-born. She grew up with her parents speaking Korean, which was a... North Korean dialect of the language, because they were both from the Pyongyang province. And so when she went to Korea, she did a few interviews there. One point made a speech, and somebody actually made a derogatory comment about her Korean. And her son has mentioned that this might be because of, again, it might come from some of that insecurity being American born and maybe not feeling like you're truly Korean, but also. There is the fact that I think she had a North Korean dialect, and she was, at this point, when she made the speech, it was already separated. Her two kids, uh, Philip and Christine Cuddy, they actually went on to research and broadcast her story so that it would not be forgotten. That's awesome. I am really glad that they're doing that because it's so important to tell Asian American stories. One thing that really struck me during this research was how little information was available about Asian Americans in U.S. military history, which is very tragic because military service is like 
often tied to like naturalization in both a literal and metaphorical sense. A lot of people see it as a way to become more American if they're joining the U.S. military. And so it's really no wonder that like so many immigrants try to join and yet not get recognized for their the way that they're trying to contribute to this country. Yeah, like the deck is already stacked in so many ways. It sucks that this is just another added part of it, this erasure. I think it's really important to also just note that like while they are making incredible achievements um, by trying to like join the military and like create their version of the American dream, it's also very telling how racist the military institution has been in the past. Even today, there's like examples of Asian Americans being discriminated against based on like Islamophobia has been a really large one post 9-11. Recently, in 2016, I believe, there were two Muslims who were ordered into industrial clothes dryers by their drill instructor, by the same drill instructor actually, and suffered burns as a result and one later committed suicide as a result of all the abuses that they faced. Other Muslim Marines have been like questioned on like whether they're truly loyal to this country or if they're terrorists. It is like very complex to, on the one hand, try to be proud of someone who like did set a first in U.S. history, but at the same time, that first is like tainted by the fact that it is the military and it is it does commit a lot of like wartime atrocities and also against foreigners and against our own people. For sure. It's it's all very complicated. Like, the system seems like it's flawed. I know the military has been definitely not one of the most progressive spaces in the U.S. government, and the whole U.S. government has its own flaws. I know that I personally understand the motivations behind Susan and why she wanted to join. I also, at the same time, recognize that this whole system is is very flawed and really people need to do a lot more work in that space to make sure that things are truly as they want it to be, which is a just system for everybody. So Susan Ann Cuddy died at 100 years old in Northridge, California in 2015. Susan's husband actually died in 1994, but she is survived by her children, siblings, and grandchildren, which I'm really happy about because they have passed on a lot of her legacy. The research we did to find out about her was from interviews and articles that featured them. And she's honored by the State Assembly of California's District 28. In 2003, they named her Woman of the Year. Three years later, she received the American Courage Award from the Asian American Justice Center in Washington, D.C. To me, that's the perfect award for her because she really needed courage to do all that she can. And I hope that I can continue to have that kind of kind of take what she did and learn and try to apply that to my life. Absolutely. My takeaway from investigating her life was really seeing all the parallels to my family history. I know Japanese occupation was a large event for Korea. It affected many of its citizens and, you know, you could see the clear impact on her life. And it also impacted my my own family, my grandparents actually, they had to leave Korea uh, because they were being persecuted by the Japanese during the Japanese occupation. So they actually went to China and lived in China for several years to basically escape that and didn't move back until like every one of the kids who were kids when they moved were adults. So it's interesting to see how much of an impact there was. And that also makes me more frustrated that In Florida schools, we don't uh, learn about Korean history pretty much at all. I think there was maybe one paragraph in one of my history classes in one of the textbooks that mentioned the Korean War, but that was it. And in fact, I gave a presentation on the Korean War in high school. Almost nobody in the class had ever heard of it before. And so it's just immensely frustrating to me that we have these experiences where we just don't know about the people that the U.S. has influenced for one way or another. These other countries. On a more lighthearted note, is that I do really want to eat her spare ribs. <laughs> the description really had me uh, wanting to try it. They sound so good. Whenever I watch Korean movies and dramas, the food always looks good. <laughs> Maybe y'all could try making it after this. It sounds pretty straightforward. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we need to like reach out to Philip and Christine, her kids, in order to get like a recipe. Yeah, they can taste test it. Let us know. <laughs> 
Philip and Christine, if you're listening to this podcast, hit us up. But yeah, I'm really glad we did this episode because I love to hear an Asian American woman get to break into what has historically been a very white, very male field. Through the process, I learned a good chunk of Korean American history and would love to keep following up on Korea and like learn more throughout the course of this podcast. But that's Susan Ann Cuddy, Navy groundbreaker. If you enjoyed hearing about important Asian Americans in history, subscribe to our podcast. If you'd like to read personal stories from the Asian American community, you can visit our website, www.whereimreallyfrom.com. Thank you for listening.